how to determine the financial feasibility of a geothermal energy project. This is what you might want to do. First, you need to define the capacity of your electricity generator, uh, the capacity of your thermal resource potential, and you need to check how is this potential going to develop if there is an annual uh, regression. And if yes, you can see if I change here the regression from 3 to 2, this has a different effect on this curve. So the gray is the capacity of the generator, the green is the <coughs> uh, thermal resource. And as you can see, um, we cannot fully utilize the capacity because our thermal resource is less than what our generator could process. Let's go back to 3% to make this a bit more clear. So for a geothermal project, this means we need to kind of seeking ways later on in the project phase to increase the thermal resource again. Let's say we do one drilling in, let's say in year 10, uh, or let's say in year 15. So you see, as soon as this goes below the capacity, we try to fill it up. Maybe earlier is actually better. So the thermal resource capacity increases. Maybe we have to do another drilling, um, a second upgrade later on, so that we can keep this resource as high and productive as we can. And then we can, we, it will give us basically the annual production volume of the electricity which can be produced through this geothermal energy project. The next topic we need to look at is how we can sell the produced energy. We either can sell at a fixed price if you have somebody who offtakes our production or we will have to uh, sell to the market or we can sell to a mix uh, through of that. Let's assume we are selling everything at the fixed price, so make it pretty easy. And then you see that normally this the production or the revenues would follow the uh, the volume, uh, basically the uh, the production volumes. However, sometimes there are uh, inflation clauses in these agreements, so the revenues can behave a bit a bit differently. So this would need to be researched what inflation uh, rates and escalation factors are applicable. Then the next topic to be researched is all the capex. We have a major capex item are for exploration of the thermal resource, uh, the drillings. Uh, we might have to spend money for land, plant, property, equipment, etc. What we also will need to determine is the rollout plan. When are we going to spend which uh, capex item? This might take uh, several years until we are fully done. Actually, some project might even take take longer. Let's assume we, we can follow this plan. So we'd first start with exploration. We will then do the drilling. I uh, will purchase the land, uh, the plant, and then we will ramp up the production first starting, let's say, at 20% with a pilot and then ramping up to, let's say, 80 and 100%. So in year five, we will be fully operational. And as you can see, the, um, basically the, here the operational year, we assume as soon as we can start with the pilot, um, pilot production. So then we have our rollout, rollout plan. The next topic what we need to research or is or to estimate is the the operating costs to operate this uh, plant. So for this we have different uh, types of costs. We have costs which might be related to a uh, percentage of revenues. We have costs which are a function of the kilowatt hours uh, sold. And then we might have various fixed uh, cost positions. So all this needs to be uh, researched, analyzed, and then summed up and feed into a financial model so that we can build a forecast. And then what we normally want to do is we want to build a forecast of the projected revenues, EBITDA, the whole PL, uh, the whole balance sheet, and the whole cash flow uh, statement. If that gives a realistic picture of the financial future of this project. As you can see here, we have zero cash at the beginning. This is because we are very tightly funded. So let's just make this a bit more gener generous. Let's say we want to keep at all times a cash reserve of 1 million. 
Uh, let's go back here. If we take this cache reserve, then we are a bit more safe, and then we can see how our plan develops. We can also see that at one point we will then be able to to pay dividends, but we we first will need to, in this case, we'll need uh, some debt financing, and we'll also have to service the debt. Uh, these two are debt positions, and to to repay the debt. Um, then what we want to do is to have a look at the uh, financial metrics of the whole project and want to now to look is this project feasible or not. So uh, we will focus on these metrics first the unlevered um, based on unlevered cash flows and here we want to see if the, the IRR is higher than the discount rate that's the case here so this project um, it, it seems to work. And then when we assume debt financing, we can even uh, increase the IRR and we also, because the, the equity portion will only be a, one part of the funding sources. If we go back to users and source of fund, you see that here our only portion needs to be funded through equity. We have some uh, financial debt and this financial debt we can estimate with the loan to value uh, ratio. If, for instance, we are a bit more conservative we only have one loan if we are a bit more aggressive we have two loans now the question is is this feasible can we obtain so much um, financing from banks and to answer this question we have to look at the forecasted um, bank ratios for this we will need the EBITDA from the PL, and we also need the, um, uh, the financial uh, debt position from the balance sheet and we also need the, um, uh, the free cash flows. And what we're now going to analyze is the debt service coverage ratio. Uh, does the free cash flow, is there a sufficient full cash flow available to service the debt? And you can see we have here, these are during ramp up, this can be ignored, but here you see we have 2.6 times as much cash flow as we have to service the debt, so we have sufficient, uh, there's no problem, we can easily service the debt. And if you look at how much debt we have with respect to the EBITDA, we see that we get up to 3.4 times, and then as we repay the debt, it gets it gets lower. So there's no there's no problem. This is pretty feasible, and this also means that this is a realistic plan. Then the next question we want to answer is: so we know now it's the project is feasible. So do we find somebody? Does this project make sense for a developer? So a developer, if you go back to the project plan, what he will do is, you see here, there's a lot of risk, especially can also be that exploration goes wrong, there is no terminal resource. So in order to assume this risk and pay for the drilling, and then also construction of the plant, uh, this developer needs to be compensated for its risk and also um, given <laughs> his businesses to develop a project, he might not want to stay on for too long, so he might want to, to exit. So we will have to look at his situation. Um, let's say he can exit after five years because then the project will be de-risked. Then we need to ask ourselves at what price can he exit. Here we have different um, ways to forecast the <coughs> expected exit price. Normally we do we, uh, we take something like EV EBITDA as an example. And let's say we start with seven times. Then based on our model, it will give us an exit, um, an exit value for the equity. And then based on that, it will flow into the cash flows of the developer and we calculate his returns. So you see in that case, that's a pretty attractive project. And a developer normally should whatever his requirements are we put in at a hurdle rate he needs and if his IRR is higher than his hurdle rates then this means this is an attractive project and he should he should do that among other factors but it's one key factor to look at. Then the next question is do we have is it possible for the developer uh, to exit? So if the developer analyzes the project will he be comfortable that he can exit this project to somebody who will just want to, to hold it and there are <clears throat> um, sometimes there are institutional investors there that are looking for stable returns and so institutional investors they might also have their 
return requirements. So let's say they're a bit more aggressive. Let's say they're 10%. And now for a future buyer buying in at this price and then getting all the cash flows of the project, you see that this IRR is a bit tight. This means our exit assumption is a bit too aggressive. So we lower that. And if we do that, we see that then it will work that a future buyer in five years can buy this project at a 10% IRR, it meets his return target, and for the developer it still should work because this IRR is higher than what he needs to do to this to be motivated to do this project. So that's pretty much in brief how to evaluate the financial feasibility for a geothermal energy project. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. For more information, please visit our website efinancialmodels.com. A link to the spreadsheet used is included in the description below. Thank you for watching.